that building this American-Mexican border will help somehow to protect Americans from illegal uh, drug flow from Mexico? Building a border with Mexico, I think, is just something that is used by politicians to get votes and to get headline news. The reality is that the Mexican cartels, and I know members from the Mexican cartels, met a pilot from the Mexican cartels in prison and stuff like that. The reality is that the CIA, part of the US government, is fighting some of the Mexican cartels but helping some of the others. So the drugs will always come in because the CIA enables it to happen. And all the cartels are getting weapons from America. As long as the weapons are going out and the drugs are coming in, everybody's making money. So for example, a cartel, if it wants their guys to be trained in torture and murder and to get weapons from America and all the latest techniques from America, what they do is they send Mexican policemen and Mexican soldiers mm. to America to get all the training. And the Americans can then say, these guys are policemen, these guys are soldiers, they're going to stop the drugs. And then when they go back to Mexico, they work for the cartel and they're helping the drugs. Everybody knows this, but, but there's a lot of money being made. The drug business is a half a trillion dollar a year business. And every year it gets bigger and bigger. And the CIA believed that if, for example, this goes back to the 1980s, they, they said that if the communists get control of the drugs, they will have money to get more weapons to attack America. So we, have, we must work with the mafias that are against, that are fighting communism. In the beginning, Pablo Escobar, he was donating money to the war in Nicaragua against the, 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 uh, the Contras, which was an anti-communist war. And the CIA have been doing that ever since. So it's, they're never ever going to stop the drugs because it's, it's such a big business and the CIA is involved and um, that's why it's kept as a black market because if they made it all legal there would be no black market and this all would end they don't, they don't have to build a wall so all they've got to do is make drugs legal and all this hundred, over 100,000 people dead in Mexico war on drugs it would all end but they will never make it legal because they know all those profits from fighting the war on drugs and smuggling the drugs will go away it's one of the most profitable things uh, for corrupt CIA and corrupt politicians to make money off and corrupt police as well are there any facts, evidences for this? Yeah, if you... If, can you, can you okay, Gary Webb was the journalist who found out that the crack epidemic in America, the cocaine coming in, a vast amount of that cocaine coming in, was coming in through the CIA. It was coming in from South America and it was, it was going to an airport in Arkansas called Mena. And I've actually written a book on this subject called American Made. And the governor of Arkansas at that time was Bill Clinton. And the CIA had the power over the operation. And the guy who was in charge of that was George H.W. Bush. So George H.W. Bush basically was the biggest mafia kingpin and biggest drug dealer of that time. But in the, in the face of the public, he was saying he was putting all these people in prison for drugs because of this war on drugs and he was saving young people when actually through the CIA he was he was bringing the drugs in it's all documented by Gary Webb the journalist if anyone wants to google it Gary Webb they discredited him they hounded him the CIA had him followed and in the end he was found dead from suicide they said but with two bullets to the head can you tell a bit more about ecstasy business that you were involved in before your imprisonment Yep, so basically I did business studies at Liverpool University and I applied that to the stock market and I made a lot of money in the stock market but I had no common sense, I was in my 20s, I was emotionally immature and I started to buy ecstasy for me and my friends and in the beginning I was giving it away for free to my friends, showing off, you know, as a young man and that was getting me more friends so I was thinking, yeah, this is cool and then I started to see the business potential because ecstasy was so hard to get. I could get it in, you know, and make 100% profit or whatever. So I started to apply my business studies knowledge to running an ecstasy business. 
And in the beginning, I was buying a thousand pills, two thousand pills out of Los Angeles. Then I was getting like twenty thousand, thirty thousand pills out of Holland. I had two hundred people working for me. I was throwing parties for up to ten thousand people. I had my own bodyguards, bouncers who were armed, protecting me. And I thought I was living like a character out of a movie. It, it all gone to my head. It was all feeding the madness. And I didn't understand, you know, I, was, I thought keeping the party going, I didn't fully mm -hmm. understand that the harm that drugs caused society at that point until I was in the jail. Yeah. And when you were involved in this business, how did you manage to, to, to get this access? I understand you mm -hmm. cannot tell everything, but just... Okay. At the peak of the business, when I was smuggling it from Holland, I would fly people from Phoenix, Arizona to Europe, maybe France or Germany. Not, not Holland, Holland, because they know that to, they, they, that's a drug route. Then these people, they get the train from France or Germany over to Holland. They get the pills. They put the pills in pillowcases or computer towers, with sc screwed into computer towers. And then they get on the train and they go back to France or Germany and then they fly from France, for example, to Mexico City. And then they fly from Mexico City to Hermosillo, which is near California and Arizona. And I have property in Mexico and I have operations in Mexico. I take the pills back and different people then smuggle them into America. If there is a spring break and all the students are in Mexico, then that's perfect time because the People at the border, they're too busy to search everybody. So that's when you get the drugs back the easiest. This was before 9-11. If people now had drugs in that many drugs and put them on a plane, they, they would get caught. So, so don't try this at home. <laughs> yeah. yeah. But what made you safe? Like, how did you protect yourself not to be okay. captured? I had the protection of the most dangerous gang mafia in Arizona. They were called the New Mexican Mafia at that time. And how I got the protection was a complete accident. I was at a party in an apartment complex where I had people who work, worked for me in this apartment complex. And a dealer came to the complex. He was dealing cocaine and weed and crystal meth. And he was a Mexican-American guy. He had a lot of tattoos and stuff. Rugged guy. And I started to, I started to talk to this guy. And people were getting high in this apartment. And then a policeman walked in and he said, I could smell weed from outside, nobody move. And he's, call, he's gonna call the police and have everybody arrested. Now the guy I was speaking to, the Mexican American guy, pulls out a gun, put, points at the policeman's head and says, the only one who's not moving is you motherfucker. Everybody else, go. So we all just ran out into the night. So then I'm hiding in an apartment in the same complex and we hear a knocking on the back window. There's police sirens and all kinds of the police are chasing this guy and he knocks on our back window and we let him in and he says, they can't come in, they need a warrant, don't answer the door, they'll go away. And there's helicopter, there's dogs, there's everything and we're like, oh my God, we're so going to jail. So anyway, they came and they knocked and we didn't answer the door and they couldn't come in and we protected him. And then that night I put him in my car, took him to my house and left it, kept him at my house overnight so he wouldn't get arrested. And the next day he said, look, Sean, you protected me. Me and my brothers will protect you. We've got your back. I didn't know what that meant. So a month later he says, come and meet my brothers. So I go, I go to this house, there's all these Mexican lowrider cars outside. There's these big tattooed Mexican Americans with you know, all, all these prison tats on their arms and wife beater shirts and shorts and um, looking at me like none of them smiled. They all look very mean. And I'm getting scared and I look over at the TV. It's the biggest TV I've ever seen. And there's another little TV and it's showing the road, all the cars on the road. But on the big TV, I'm like, no, it can't be. It was a rocket propelled grenade launcher on the TV. They had an RPG on the TV, like out of a Rambo movie. So I'm thinking, oh my God, you know, who are these guys? So they, they're joking about my accent. They make me snort some drugs to show that I'm not a cop. And then I started doing business with them. And I would, I would go over to, you know, supply them ecstasy and stuff. And um, 
About two years later, they were all arrested. I was going to the house the night they were arrested. I was on the street. The whole street was blacked out because the police had not turned everybody's electricity off. They had police out with the light ones directing traffic and they all got arrested. And it was news headlines, New Mexican Mafia, most violent, dangerous people in Arizona, murder for hire. They were killing witnesses, killing police, killing judges, tried to kill the head of the prison system. And, and those, those were the guys who protected me. I didn't know until I saw it on the news. Yeah. Are they still in prison? Yeah, a lot of them got very long sentences. Uh, most of them are in prison. And what uh, did you personally experience dealing with them? Did you afraid of them? How, yeah. How did it? I could, I could tell because, all right, as someone in the ecstasy rave scene where people are smiling and dancing and it's not like Scarface, but when I went to their house, it was like Scarface. They were all looked deadly. They had big guns, machine guns, all kinds of guns. And the atmosphere in there was always very serious. So whenever I went there, I always wanted to leave as quickly as possible because I was so nervous. Yeah. Uh, did you afraid to do something wrong? Did you have this fear of that you could have been killed? Yeah, I did. I sensed it. I didn't know the extent of it until I saw him on the news. What happened was someone leaving the house got pulled over by the police and spoke to the police. So everyone who came to the house, they thought was a snitch. So I went to the house and they said to them, they said, Sean, did you get pulled over by the police? I said, no, I didn't get pulled over by the police. They said, are you, are you telling us the truth? And um, you know, they, they, they searched me and everything and um, made me take my clothes off. And, I thought I was in trouble, but they found out the other person who had spoke to the police, and then that person, I never saw, that person disappeared. That person was gone. But how did it happen that finally you were captured? Okay, there are more police informants in America than there are police on the streets of America. And in my case, informants gave my name in. And there was 10 informants who gave my name into the police. So the police then, they, they tried to buy drugs from us. And they were always obvious, you know, we're from out of state, want to buy some ecstasy, we go away. So they said to the judge, we can't buy drugs from this guy because he, he knows we're police. So the judge said, okay, you can l listen to the phones. And it was a wiretap. And they, they listened to like five, 10,000 phone calls. And that's how they got us. Because I had my own bouncers, like 30 guys with guns and tasers and stuff, I felt quite safe. Because in the rave scene, when I arrived, there was little gangs that were competing against each other. But then I took all those gangs and had them all work for me. So all the gangs were working together. And then each leader of the gang, we had what was called crime family dinner. And every month we went to a restaurant and each leader of each unit of, that was working under me, but we would all come and eat, eat, have a meal together, so i make sure everybody was peaceful with each other. And then I had all my bodyguards protecting me, including my best friend from my hometown, who is two years younger than me, he's called Wild Man. He's about 26 stone, his nose is pointing over here, and his fists are twice as big as mine, it's just all human uh, teeth marks from all the fights he's had, so he was, you know, when Wild Man's around, you feel safe. Yeah. And all of these guys were white or some of them were Mexican? Okay, in my ecstasy business, they were of all races. People who got arrested with me, there was black people, there was uh, Asian, um, Mexican-American, Mexican, all races. And all these guys came after you got this protection from this gang leader, right? So he helped you to build uh, the team. Or you chose these guys? Uh, no, I chose the guys myself. When I, got, when I came to America, the rave scene was very small. And I was one of the first people to get involved in the rave scene. And, you know, the people who were trying to throw parties, because they knew I had a lot of money, they called me the Bank of England. And they would come and ask me for money to help them throw parties. So all these different people, it, it just came about organically. They ended up working for me. I had... A million dollar house on the side of a mountain in a gated, guarded community. I had about 
five to ten apartments at various times. I had one apartment just to put the money in, one apartment to put drugs in, all kinds of people working for me. You know, twin turbo Mazda RX-7 sports car, multiple other cars, SUVs. I had all of the material things, but I learned it doesn't bring you happiness. It brings you a whole load of trouble. And um, getting detached from all that material stuff in prison was one of my biggest life lessons. You know, I had to learn that happiness is in the heart and what your thoughts make. It's not in a plasma screen TV in a sports car. So, what were your thoughts about when you were possessing all this? When I possessed all these material things, I thought I was like a character out of a movie. I had this big house on the mountain, like Scarface. And, you know, as a young, emotionally immature uh, person, that's what I aspired to because my prior priorities were all wrong. I'd watched these movies as a teenager. I thought, yeah, that's cool. If I could do that, you know, I'd be the man. And, um, Taking drugs was feeding it. The drugs were saying, yeah, keep, keep this going, keep this going. But once the cloud lifted out of my head and I looked back, I was horrified at what I'd done. And I was wondering how on earth I was still alive. But still, when you were doing this ecstasy business yeah. and you were going and you went to sleep, did you think about some stuff, the purpose of life or something? They started, people start thinking when they're suffering. <laughs> or you were just... <laughs> You just tried not to speak with your consciousness. How did you deal with yourself? Drugs erode your consciousness. And it's a slow process whereby at the peak of it, when I was running around with all my bodyguards and the New Mexico Mafia were protecting me and Sammy the Bull Gravano was looking to kill me, it seemed normal to me because I'd taken drugs for 10 years. And it, it slowly, over those years, it, I'd... I'd, I'd got to this point in time and I surrounded myself with people who were on the same wavelength, were taking the drugs and we were all reinforcing each other's crazy behavior. There was no one sober taking a look at us saying, hey Sean, you need to put the brakes on. And I wasn't capable of doing it because the clouds, the cloud in my head that drugs had put there had scrambled my decision making processes. The cops put a virus in my computer called a Netbus Trojan horse, which showed them everything. And then the day I got arrested, the, the, the cops took all my money. Can you tell a bit more about Pablo Escobar, if, if you have time? Yeah, Pablo uh, Escobar. Why have you decided to write this book? Mm -hmm. And have you ever had a chance to meet somebody from his team? or what? Well, I've met people from the Mexican cartel. Okay, so I wrote books about myself for several years. And then I, something clicked in my brain and I thought to myself, you, you're not that important. You need to start writing about things that are bigger than you. So I wrote about Pablo Escobar. It's got a lot of interest worldwide. And my Pablo Escobar book, Beyond Narcos, was an immediate bestseller. Now, as someone who's been in the drug business and served time, you know, I've got an interesting perspective to write about that kind of material. And the further I researched it, you know, I came to realize that drug laws created Pablo Escobar. If cocaine wasn't illegal, there would be no black market. He would have never been able to make profits from cocaine like he did. The other thing is, as well, the government said when they took Pablo Escobar down, when they killed him, or he shot himself behind the ear, that's what his family say, which is what I believe, because he didn't want to get taken alive. They said Pablo was smuggling 90% of the drugs into America. So when he died, what happened with the cocaine going into America? Did it stop? It increased. And that's because the CIA was also bringing drugs in at that time. And the CIA was working with the Cali cartel, Pablo's main competition, who were also bringing drugs in. And the Castaño brothers, who formed a death squad with the help of the CIA to help wipe out lots of Pablo's family and friends, they were also bringing the cocaine in. So the war on drugs is a complete lie. George H. W. Bush said, yeah, Pablo's bringing 90% of the cocaine in. Pablo's dead, it should have gone down, but it didn't, it increased. And then the Cali cartel, same thing. They took the Cali cartel down, the cocaine increased. Because these people are used as scapegoats for people like the CIA and other criminal organizations who are bringing the drugs in as well. There is a deep undercover DEA agent called Michael Levine. And he was in South America 
in all, infiltrating all kinds of drug organizations. And over the years, he lost his brother, and I think he lost his son to drugs. And he got to the point where he didn't care anymore about what he said to the public. And he decided to tell the public the truth. And he said every time he investigated someone in the mafia that was near the top of a certain organization, the CIA would come in and say, it's in the interest of national security that you stop this investigation now. What is it for you, happiness mm -hmm. inside? How, how, to how can we understand it? I thought that making money would give me happiness. And what I learned was helping other people gives you happiness. It's good for your karma. You know, a year in the jail, first year I was pining for all my material stuff back and my lifestyle back. But once in the second year when I was on the verge of committing suicide, I started to see that prisons weren't full of paedophiles and rapists and murderers. That's a small percentage that the public are frightened of by the media. It was mostly low-level drug users, mostly vulnerable people, the biggest houses of the mentally ill. And hearing their sad stories, it opened my heart to what was going on. I started to read their legal paperwork, help them write home in Spanish, and then write down what was going on to expose what was going on. And by helping other people, that stopped my ego it gave me a, a sense of satisfaction. So I've tried to increase that now. I've come out of prison. I do over 100 talks a year across the country, speak to 10 to 20,000 students a year, and I scare, the, scare them in the hope they won't do all of the silly stuff that I did.